Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Linux Lads. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not Shane. Um, Shane has said he's been super tired. He's been working his ass off despite the COVID-19 madness. So um, I'll be your host for this evening. And joining me today, as always, is Mike. Hi, uh. And we're also joined by a very special guest, Rocco. Say hello to everyone. Hello, I am not Shane. <laughs> <laughs> Who could tell, hey? Right. Uh, hi, Rocco. And uh, thanks thanks for coming on the show. Uh, it, it is my pleasure. I love listening to you guys. You guys have such a great chemistry together. It's awesome. No problem at all. Um, one thing off the bat I'll ask you, Rocco, is have you ever played the game Metal Gear Solid? Metal Gear Solid. No, I have not played the game Metal Gear Solid. Okay, I was going to make a reference, but that's kind of that's kind of died on its ass at the moment. But that's okay. I would highly recommend that um, people go out and play the game Metal Gear Solid. It's a very good game. Is, that must be. I remember playing it when it was already old, and it was about two thousand and eight. So, is that the thing that you're referring to? Like, it's um, the original Metal Gear Solid is a PlayStation One game. Or, okay. And then there was a sec a second one and a third one on the PlayStation 2, and then the PlayStation 3 had the fourth one. Not sure about the fifth. I think the fifth might have been the PlayStation 4. So there I've play I must have played it on the original Xbox, I think. Uh, um, there were other ports, yeah. I think there was P PC ports of it as well, but the the very original was PlayStation 1 exclusive, I think. But there, might have, there, there might have been... Um, ports after the fact but at the time it was it was playstation exclusive how do you a playstation uh elitist uh, no <laughs> <laughs> uh people can play whatever platform they want well i know it's uh really popular but uh, i've never played it so rocco why don't you tell us a bit about yourself um so what do you do for a living and uh or what do you how would people know you from the interwebs? Well, people would not know me for what I do for a living because I am a plumber. So, Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, that is something that people wouldn't know me for. Uh, but I do have a YouTube channel, a podcast, however you want to call it. Uh, we do a live stream on Saturday nights called Big Daddy Linux Live where we get a bunch of the community members together. In one room, I think this past week, we had 32 people on a Zoom chat, and it's pure craziness at times because, you know, trying to moderate something like that when everybody's talking, uh, but it is so much fun, and we do that every week. We do a distro challenge for two weeks, um, and then I do a show called Linux Spotlight, so that is a, a collection of everybody journey into Linux, and Connor, you were on there. I was indeed. And I believed you talked to me for a whole two hours. And I'm surprised <laughs> you did not cut 50% out of it. I, I usually leave most of everything in there. I mean, unless it's something like, I, you know, uh, something major, I usually leave it in there. So is it fair to say that Linux is uh, one of your biggest, if not the biggest uh, hobby for you? It is the biggest hobby for me. Um, I have been using Linux probably since 2003, 2004, 2005, somewhere in that area. You know, as you go along, the details kind of get fuzzy on, you know, years and specific dates and stuff. But uh, yeah, somewhere in that time frame. And I didn't start a YouTube channel or a podcast until I think it was late 2016, where I ended up uh, starting Destination Linux with Rob Collins. And... Actually, it was uh, 2016 when I started the YouTube channel. It was 2017, I think, was our first episode, the beginning of it. Wow. So, it's It's been feeling like you've been... And that is one of the very early shows that I remember just being there and being like solid quality, like knocking it out of the park. And so it's... it's in in the, my mind, it feels like it was earlier, but when you say it was only 20, 2017, I'm thinking, wow, that was only, what, um, three years ago, three, four years ago. Well, I have went back and listened to some of those episodes, and man, they are not quality. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, I remember listening to them when I used to cycle uh, across half of Dublin to, to my 
previous job and uh, you know you were one of those podcasts that I would stick on uh, through that miserable journey through rain sleet cold temperature and uh, mad drivers and it was it was uh, it's always been with any podcast that I that, 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 like Linux podcast it's really good to listen to people who share this hobby and who are willing to talk about that so uh, yeah it was it, it is definitely been really good really good uh, going back to 2000 and something uh, how did you first hear about Linux how did you get to it well, it's funny you mention that because doing these Linux Spotlight episodes and I hear all of these different people talk about how they started in Linux, I I kind of, re, you know, you kind of fill in the blanks on your own story of, oh, yeah, that happened. And uh, Dave Dreaming Wolf was one of the Linux Spotlight episodes, and he had mentioned that he had heard about, uh, you know, Linux and Ubuntu in uh, the overclocker forums. And, and I'm thinking to myself, that's exactly where I heard about um, this new this new Linux thing, and I used the uh, Wilby installer to install it, and that brings it, me back. Oh, God, that <laughs> right? Brings me back. Oh God, yeah. And uh, the first time it didn't go too well. Um, second time I tried it, it was uh, it was a good experience as far as installing it. It it went well, but at the time I I didn't know how to use it, basically. It, well, that's what it came down to. I couldn't see my files on my other drive. I didn't know how to get to them. So it was like this is I had this great operating system that I could use, but I, but I was handcuffed basically by my lack of knowledge. So I, you know, went back to Windows and then later ended up installing it again, and just fell in love with the fact that I could start changing stuff. And this is back in KDE three point five days. And you could just change everything, and it was awesome. Yeah, that was customizable to everybody. Yeah, it was. If you wanted to board your computer as well, KD three point five was <laughs> absolutely the right tool for that too. <laughs> and you I are think so it's right. the the Trinity. Trin is this the the Trinity yeah, desktop? It is. The, it is the Trinity desktop. Yeah, it's yeah, the continuation of KD three. Well, you know, some people some people still use XP, so I I assume there are people who really like the three point five version of KDE. It used to be the the uh, the default on Slackware, I think, for the longest time. And uh, so, yeah, you know, people people like what they like. Yep. And that brings us smoothly into what is the distribution you're running at the moment. I can already spot that there is some. Um, pop os backgrounds in your background there but i don't know if you just liked the background and decided to put it on a different distro or is that running pop os in the background no that is definitely running pop os i have one computer back there running uh, peppermint one running pop os but the main machine and as much as i love distro hopping uh i've got to the point where in the last year or two that i just want a stable system to be there when i go to it so I love customizing, but I don't like fixing it when I break it. Yeah. So I have a test machine for that kind of stuff, and the main system runs Pop! OS. Okay, so um, your machine that you're recording on at the moment, that's running Pop! OS as well, is it? That is correct. And I've, it's been my longest running distro because I'm a reformed distro hopper, and I've been running Pop! OS since April of last year. So it's almost, it's coming up on a year. Oh, wow. Wow, um, I don't. I don't think I've ever spent a year on a yeah, on exactly. distribution. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what what makes you stick? Is it the solidity of it, or is it is there anything specific that makes you stick to it? Well, I have always switched back and forth between KDE and GNOME, and KDE got to the point where I spent more time customizing it because I could, and less time actual work. So I ended up sticking with GNOME now and the Pop! OS with all of the, the, the extra features that they have and the, the time that they put into the, to the distro itself. It, I love the theme. It is the first distro that I have not changed the theme on, which is us usually the first thing I do. So it's just been a perfect fit for me. 
So you're basically saying that um, Rocco may have a trouser accident if there's ever a Pop OS KDE edition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, I think that would be bad. Only okay. because I would change everything and mess <laughs> everything up. <laughs> Well, there's definitely something for uh, enhancing your productivity by reducing your options. I, uh, I on the last last since the last time I changed uh, distributions, I haven't even changed the backdrop because the back um, the wallpaper because uh, I would have to first figure out how to do it on this. And um, it's been you know I I understand uh, that uh, I've used Popovas before and it's really nice. And uh, do you have any? Any System76 hardware at all? I don't. Came with? I wish I did, and I love the new um, lemur that came out that they just announced. That is fantastic. But that no, I don't. Good, yeah. I don't have any System76 yeah. hardware. As part, so I assume so. You like you like KDE because because you can customize it, but you like GNOME because it basically lets you work. Do you have any favorite other? Do you have any other favorite uh, tools? Like a favorite text editor, and that is a correct quest, uh, answer to that. Do you have a favorite browser, uh, something like this? Hint: It's not Emacs. <laughs> right. Well, okay. So I'm not even going to get into the text editor war <laughs> because that's just not even right. Oh, dear. <laughs> I I don't care, but Mike does. So that's the reason why no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm joking. Him. Obviously, obviously, I'm joking. I, everybody is uh, free to make incorrect choices, but uh, yeah. Right. Well, I I probably use the incorrect choice of gedit. <laughs> I also use gedit all the freaking time. It's so good. But um, I mean, most of the stuff that I would say that is important to me is stuff that has to do with uh, editing and finishing the podcast and the videos for YouTube. So OBS off OBS uh, Studio is one that I have to have, and that's something that is super important to me. Um, and then DaVinci Resolve. Even though it's not an open source editor, a video editor, it is the best tool for the job for me. It is absolutely amazing. So I can see because I also wanted to ask, we wanted to ask about your, if you have any core beliefs in Linux uh, or in open source, because there's plenty of people have got different uh, beliefs, opinions, philosophies, call it what you will. So I can see that you are probably on the more pragmatic end of things with uh, with you. I'd just like to interject for a moment. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm. Oh, come on! <laughs> not really. Just because. Just because my beard is taking off uh, on its own, all, almost right now. He, has, and, uh, he definitely is rocking the COVID beard. Yeah, and uh, that doesn't mean that I'm uh, that I'm becoming a GNU slash slash Mike. <laughs> so. Yeah, sorry. Back to the questions. Do you have uh, what kind of uh, beliefs or philosophies do you have, if any, when it comes to open source, free software, licensing, or whatever everybody uses, education, that kind of stuff? Well, I believe that you should use the best tool for the job, regardless of what that is. So, I would love for there to be an open source software alternative to every aspect of whatever you're doing. Sometimes that's possible, and sometimes the best tool for the job happens to be a proprietary piece of software. So I am a pragmatist, and you know, for example, I use uh, I dual boot with Windows because uh, I play Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and that doesn't run on Linux. But I use it as a tool. I don't use it as an operating system. So I will boot into Windows, and I will play a game, and I will boot out of Windows, and then go about my business. So it's more or less a hardware virtual machine, basically, for Windows <laughs> to play a game or something like that. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely on the pragmatic side because, for example, um, if you go down the list of video editors, Caden Live, Shotcut, uh, Shotwell, um, Olive, they're all great choices. And they may work for a specific set of circumstances of what you're doing. But I have found that DaVinci Resolve is, um, and for lack of a better term, leagues above the, that software. It just opens up so many doors and gives you so many options along with uh, accelerated hardware for the rendering. And all, I could go on a, a tangent on DaVinci Resolve itself. So for me, that ends up being the best tool for the job. And uh, I agree, I believe that everybody else should use the best tool for the job. 
Do you, except for video editing and uh, the odd game, do you have any other uh, issues or spaces where Linux is basically lacking, or where not Linux but maybe open source is lacking? Um, I don't know if open source is lacking in any area. I, I think we have alternatives for pretty much everything that, that you want to do. Uh, it, it depends on your specific situation and what you're looking for. So would I like there to be an open source alternative that is up to par with DaVinci Resolve? Yes. But uh, I can look across the board, whether that's uh, office suites or audio editing, and you can look across the board and pick out great software in the open source world. Um, 100% I would, I would have to echo those points. And um, a great tool, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it on the Spotlight when I was talking to you previously there, Rocco, but um, um, alternative to to.net is a great tool. If you have a go-to um piece of software that's sticking out in your mind let's say your adobe photoshops your your uh, davinci resolves your whatever and you have i say oh uh, what i want to do x there's a standout piece of software but that's that piece of software is very expensive and i can't afford it right now or or oh it, it has a proprietary license and i want an open source alternative it's um it's a very good website for researching that kind of things so um if you go in there they would recommend um alternatives and also you can drill it down by license and platform so you could say oh uh, i want an alternatives that but it's available on linux but but a subset of that i also want um open source alternatives um i mean uh, yeah it's it's a very good real alternate it's a very good um, website for doing that kind of research but see i think it's fantastic that we have that choice that, that there are so many good open source software choices out there. And, you know, that website just highlights some of those. It's, it does a very good point. Um, yeah, I've, I've found myself that I've, I mean, I'm a pragmatist in the same sense that you are. Sometimes I will use something that is the, is, is proprietary because it's the best tool for the job or is just the, best in the sense of it's the easiest it causes to me the less friction um like i'm okay with installing spotify on linux i'm okay with installing plex media server on linux if if that is an um if that is what is involved even though i've uh, i've actually been dabbling um as of last night in jellyfin so i do check out the um 100% open source alternatives um but i don't necessarily think Oh, absolutely everything has to be open source. I mean, I've, personal anecdote, but I've encountered people who, even if it means that they will they will go for something that's free and open source, even if it means that it's inconveniencing themselves. And I don't know if I can make that, that step. I mean, power to them, well, well for them as everything like that. But I don't know if I can make that additional step. I mean, as I said, I will use Spotify. I use Spotify on my phone. I'm I pay for Spotify, and if I want Spotify on my desktop, then I will I will download and and run Spotify on my desktop. Well, I would put it to you that you do anyway, because we've just spent uh, if we've just spent uh, half an hour debugging our. Uh, mine and yours uh, audio issues so and we do that fairly often so if we all were very 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 friction uh, like uh, no, uh, I'll, if I start again if we were all extremely intolerant to uh, problems we would all probably run whatever whatever works out of the box if there is a, like a hardware audio maybe a hangout box or something like that so yeah, we, I, I hear this fairly often that uh, that people people say, well, I, I, I just don't compromise on this or I just uh, rather use something. But people still make allowances for the things that for the things that they love, like because we all, all love Linux. So we all have to make an allowance here and there, I think anyway. And it's sometimes it's hard to see because we are quite used to making these allowances and of of course if we were on windows it would be a different allowance we would have to make if we were on the mac again it would be a different allowance but uh, i think we all are making uh, decisions and are making sacrifices in order to use linux and open source 
Well, to your point, uh, it comes down to time. It comes down to how much time you have and how much time you're willing to put out there in finding these alternatives. Sometimes there's just not enough time to troubleshoot what you need to troubleshoot in order to get something working. Um, it's other times you spend an enormous amount of time troubleshooting and finding different pieces of software, like, for example, uh, Zoom. I use Zoom for the uh, live streams, and it's a proprietary piece of software. I have tried, I have spent hours, countless hours, trying all of the open source alternatives and continue to update and say I've tried it again and see how that works again. And none of them give me the options that I need in order to control a live stream in the way that I, I can with Zoom. So it gives us the least amount of headaches uh, with the most amount of time actually producing content. Having said that, um, Zoom has actually failed on us and we're actually using Jitsi Beat <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's weird. I uh, I've had I've had uh, I've had problems with Zoom this time, even though I'm pretty sure I used it on the different on work partition last week to talk to somebody. It's uh, it's like I think video conferencing on Linux and definitely audio is just problematic. It's still it's I don't know if it's ever going to be fixed, and I don't know what the reason is behind it, but it always seems to be giving me problems. Uh, Rocco. Do you have a favorite, the, you know, just to smoothly move completely somewhere else, do you have a favorite piece of Linux hardware or something that you run, run Linux on? Um, I don't have a, I don't have a favorite piece of hardware. Uh, I actually, last week or the week before, we talked about trying to get into uh, Raspberry Pis because that's something that I have never put the time and effort into. And, and part of that is because I've never found a use case that I would be, that I need. Um, but actually the open sign that I have behind me <laughs> was a perfect idea to have that be controlled by Raspberry Pi for the live stream. I just haven't got there yet. So no, I don't have any specific, I don't have a Linux a phone or any of the prototypes of the Pine phone or anything like that. Um, I do want to get a Pine phone. I do want a uh, a Pinebook Pro. That, that's something that I that I do want to get. I just don't have any right now. Um, one thing I was just think, thinking when you're saying the open sign. I mean, um, uh, an alternative would be that you could go with the whole um, radio studio and have a red record sign up in the corner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, this sign I found, or actually I didn't find it. Uh, my dad found it and thought it would be awesome for the show. So it's on the wall and it goes on every time we go live on YouTube. Uh, but it would be cool to have it go, you know, automatically. I have um, attended once the uh, European um, hangout that you do. Or the, um, that you do. Yeah. Uh, well, the what, Beat Daddy Linux Live. I'm I'm getting the plugs in there. Um, so Biddle. I have, we just call it Biddle Biddle Europe. Uh, it was. Okay, okay. Um, I I have did attend the um, European one, and almost every single time since then, I'm like he's like, dude, I've been missing you. I'm like, oh, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> like every single time since then, that I've kind of something else has come up or whatever, and I missed it. Then instantly, Rocco messaged me going, dude. I'm like, I, I will attend. I will attend. All right, again. so I'm giving you plenty of advanced warning. April <laughs> okay. 11th is the next Biddle Europe at at 3 p.m. Eastern. So, so around the around the same time that we be recording this, essentially. April 11th. So be there yeah. this time. Or be square. Uh, yeah. April 11th. That's a Saturday, right? That is a Saturday. And, uh, so the second Saturday of the month, isn't it? Yep. Yes. So we do a bit of uh, live stream every week, but we do once a month. I do a double live stream, which that becomes the Biddle Europe at three p.m. and we still have the regular Biddle at eight p.m. Eastern. Then, but yeah. So you have okay. So you are when you say Eastern, that means that you are on the eastern side of the United States. That's uh, five hours more or less behind UTC, isn't it? Correct. It'd yeah. be, it'd be five p.m. Two... EDT or three p.m. EDT. Sorry. <laughs> There was yeah. a spanner of the in the works this week because, um, yeah, was it uh, you guys train change your um, daylight savings a little bit two weeks before we do? So, yep. 
so it it landed last night so myself and mike were literally back and messaging back and forth saying oh is he still um on for that time we're like yeah 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 wait the time changed so then i <laughs> panicked and i kind of messaged you going dude do you, do you realize the time change are you still okay <laughs> Yeah. No, it actually changed last night in the middle of Biddle for the Europe guys. So the oh, guys that connected yeah. from Europe, they started it. And um, in the middle of that, it changed over so it ended up being <laughs> 3 a.m. for them <laughs> by the end of it. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I don't like, I don't like that uh, the governments still do this. I don't know. Anyway, that's a completely different discussion. Uh, so you are, you, when you say Biddle, you mean Big Daddy Linux. Live. Uh, live, yep. which as you as you said, that's a stream of how many people do you normally have there? So in normally on YouTube viewing it live, we'll have over 100 people viewing it and in the YouTube chat. But in the Zoom room itself talking, we have anywhere from 25 to 32 people. How do you manage that? I, I'm having problems, uh, you know, there's sometimes problems talking to one person. Sometimes <laughs> how do you, how do you manage? It's very difficult sometimes. I mean, uh, some weeks are better than others. Um, but we will, what will, what will happen is the first hour we will do a distro. Well, for two weeks, we do a distro challenge. So for the first hour of each show, we will talk about each person's experience and I'll just go down the list of people and there's other people that actually helped me do this so uh zebedee boss my friend pz eric adams uh dan simmons um nate uh, these guys will help introduce the person uh and watch the waiting room and so there's no way i could do it by myself i mean i started it by myself but these guys helped me out and and helped tremendously so um We'll go down the list for the distro hour, and then the second hour, it just opens up to whatever we want to talk about, whatever subject somebody wants to bring up. And it's just, it's basically a big virtual lug is what it is. This is the amazing thing about this, I think, right now is that with coronavirus uh, and people being locked in their places, there are going to be plenty of Linux user groups or Linux communities that will try to transfer uh, their uh, their uh, meetups online, and I think one way definitely to do that is uh, the way you guys are doing it. So, you are you getting any inquiries from from uh, Linux user groups or anybody who would like to who would like to basically do a virtual lug? No, I've not got any inquiries, but we have been getting an uptick of people in joining. So you know everybody's affected by this thing, and what it does is it gives people an outlet just to be normal and talk to people when you're closed in. And last night we had, uh, we did the Linux Mint Debian edition and we had the Mintcast guys there. So Leo and Tony and Joe joined us and interacted with all the people as far as their experiences. And if they were having trouble, they jumped in on, hey, how, you can fix it this way. So it is just a big virtual lug that is filled with such a great community. There are so many different levels of experience, different levels of, of history. And, you know, Alan Pope was there last night. All kinds of different people show up. Uh, Wimp, Martin Wimper shows up, um, you know, on the European versions. So it's, it's an amazing thing to watch and see it grow. And I've just loved doing it. It's very interesting that you mentioned um, the Linux Mint Debian edition, of course, because... Is what was it? It was about a week ago when it was released, um, uh, roughly weeks, speaking. Yeah. And I remember, um, Mike. I don't know if you're you're there during the chat at the at the time, but I remember, um, I just was checking it out on a virtual machine just to check it out, and then I was posting kind of screenshots into the um into our own Telegram group, and at one stage I just the thought just occurred to me and said, okay. So I know what it's like by default. It seems to be pretty standard. Um, I'm going to see if I can uh, break this or see what happens if, if I do something crazy. So virtual machine, it's like uh, if if it completely and utterly borks the system, then I can always just delete it and whatever, no no harm, no foul. So I decided to point um, Linux Mint Debian Edition at Debian testing just to see what, what would work. It updated successfully, but of course, all the, it, the internal... Um, 
uh, update tools completely um, crap themselves like they kept saying um, <laughs> like there seems to be a problem with your your with your repos the, your repos are corrupt and everything like this so I was, I was thinking oh yeah well that's probably understandable considering that the tools that have been written for it are expecting to be seeing these certain repos and everything whereas I've completely taken the, the carpet from underneath them <laughs> so it worked but you would just have to do every, all the updates for the command line I would like to see if the updates would continue working about half, like half a year into it, or if it just eventually breaks because uh, some dependencies just aren't there. Uh, I think it was pointing at it was actually pointing at Debian testing itself, not the the um, Debian testing code name. Because if you point it at the current Debian testing code name, it eventually that will transition into Debian stable. So you'll go from Debian testing to Debian stable because the the stable has taken over the that that code name branch. Whereas if you don't use the code name and if you literally just put it in as Debian testing, it'll it's almost like a rolling Debian testing distro. But they don't recommend it because they, they it goes through um transition phases. In other words, it will gradually get more stable as it gets closer to the stable the stable branch taking it over. And um, but then immediately after that it'll it goes into almost like Sid freaking nightly um testing territory. So they say that it goes from kind of goes from one extreme to the other. Um if you're into that sort of thing, it's 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 interesting. Um tangentially related, there's actually distributions that are actually based off Debian testing. So I think they kind of shield well, like Ubuntu, for example. Uh well <laughs> no I mean like like full on is just Debian testing, but like a little bit customized. Um, uh, is it Sparky Linux? So they have a stable and a roll. They have a stable branch and they have a rolling branch, and their rolling branch, I believe, is based off Debian testing. So, well, anyway. MX Linux, you can switch to testing if you'd like to. <laughs> yeah, I've I've heard so many good things about Debian or about um, MX Linux, but I've now not really had the chance to check it out bar very briefly in a virtual machine but um it does seem to be very good um with a nice kd very heavily customized kd but customized in a good way they do it's a very nice theme and i think they've some transition transparency and things like that so it's very nicely set up um version of De both debian and um uh, xfc kd no xfc Talking about smooth transitions, how do we go back to the point? <laughs> uh, there is so we were talking about uh, BDDL or as you call it, Biddle. Yes. Uh, and uh, so just so that's a that's a basically a virtual Linux user group with uh, twenty people. You said on the Zoom chat. If if well, up, how long does it how long does it last? How long does it, is your luck like, in session? It's okay. So it is two hours long. So the first hour is the distro challenge. Second hour is the anywhere we want. But then when we end the live stream, we stay on there for another hour just talking about everything and anything. And I think sometimes the the uh, after show is more exciting than the show that's on YouTube because everybody's more calm. Everybody's more relaxed. You know, they feel like they can say whatever they want. So it's like that's actually just... sometimes more fun. You should secretly record that. I do. Uh, I record everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how oh, do you're you... telling me this, this now? <laughs> uh, I record everything. Uh, yes. Uh, what do you need to do to? Or what do you need to have set up to join in? So obviously, have a browser for Zoom or to Zoom up. And uh, do you do you check people's quality of microphone or anything like that? So when we start the meeting, right before we start the meeting, we will go through and do mic checks for anybody that's already there. Uh, you, you, we prefer you to have the Zoom client because that actually gives you more control over Zoom settings like your mic and everything. You can connect through the browser. That's you know acceptable. But we would prefer to have you to have the downloaded Zoom. And they have a Debian version. They have a, It's in the Arch repositories. Uh, there's a version for pretty much every Linux out there. Um, we don't do mic checks after the show starts. So if you join afterwards, we just hopefully, you know, okay, so it it's something that we do that we try to make professional, 
But at the end of the day, it's just a virtual lug that we're all getting together to talk to. So there are times where people talk over each other because of connection issues, or there are times where, hey, somebody's mic just went crazy and we have to you know, fumble for the mute button for that person and uh, mute them right away. So that does happen. But basically, uh, you download Zoom and you go to bigdaddylinux.com forward slash Zoom, which then takes you, opens up the Zoom application and it connects you to the meeting. If you do that at somewhere a couple minutes before 8 o'clock, you'll join in, into the Zoom room. There's a waiting room that we, uh, that's how we control the meeting itself. Uh, and then once we let you in through the waiting room, you're in and, you know, you can just chat. Very quickly, and one of the most common issues that people tend to have when it comes to joining any kind of video chat is they have their speakers and their microphone and whether it's the desktop speakers or laptop speakers or something even worse when it's laptop speakers because what is happening is your microphone is picking up the output from the, and it's just creating a feedback loop so um if you're ever experiencing that issue always um connect with or always listen via headphones so that way what you're listening to does not feed back into your microphone just a quick tip yeah, well, again, it goes back to, you know, it's just a virtual lug. So there'll be times where people are smashing on their keyboard that we have to say, hey, you know, nobody can hear because you're smashing on your keyboard. But uh, I mean, it, it happens. Ex exactly. Exactly. My point. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's all uh, a good time and a fun time for everybody that joins. And we end it with a last word for everybody. So even if you go that two hours and you and you don't, have a chance to speak or you don't want to speak i go through the list of everybody that's there at the end to give them a last word and that's more just to be able to say no matter how much time you have put into this show you get you get a say regardless so it's a genuinely um i mean i think i tweeted this out and said it's like it's such a wholesome bunch of people that you f you feel like no matter what you say, there's never going to be any judgment. Um, you, I mean, everyone kind of errs and ifs and buts and everything like that. And it's just that's the nature of it. I mean, if I, I, I listen back to the very early versions of this show and I'm erring and ifing and butting all the freaking time. And even now, I mean, I, I very rarely listen back to these uh, recordings because I'm thinking, I just can hear every single air and if and but and everything. But I suppose that that's just the nature of, of what things are. And if I, if I focused on that, then I'll be too nervous to do the, do the show in the first place. So there's no point in getting hung up on it. Yeah. Well, everybody is welcome to join. We do keep it uh, pretty much family friendly uh, for mm -hmm. the conversation. But everybody is welcome to join and join in the conversation. The more the merrier. So the only problem with it is the Zoom client on Linux only allows for 25 people in the gallery view. So on the Linux version of Zoom, you can have up to 100 people. Now, obviously, <laughs> that would get so small of a screen, yeah. like uh, that wouldn't be feasible, but uh, it would be so nice. And I have contacted Zoom before about it and still do today uh, about adding that feature to more people for more participants. Um, so I have to switch back and forth between screens uh, when somebody's talking that's on the end of the list. But yeah, it, everybody gets a say in it, and it's fantastic. So, so that's a that's a limit only on how many people you actually see on your screen, not a limit on how many participants you can hear or how many people can be in the virtual room, isn't it? Correct. So you can have I can have up a hundred people in the room, but I I'm capturing that Zoom screen. Uh, from OBS, so I can only see 25, and then if I need to see the rest, I have to hit the button next to it to pan to that screen. So, um, so you're saying that Rocco is going to purchase an AK monitor? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually a Zoom limitation, so uh, I don't. It, there's really nothing I can do until they uh, allow more participants on that first page. So the next thing you do is uh, Linux Spotlight. Uh, so that's a uh, how how often, what kind of a show, if you can introduce it in a few words? Please. Well, um, again, that started through Biddle, where people were giving their uh, 
their Linux journey. We started going down the list of, hey, what, how did you start in Linux? Where did you first hear about so it? It's real cool. And I thought that would be cool to have a place where everybody's story was in one place. You could go, you could count on going to this place to get their Linux story. And it's that started Linux Spotlight. So it is a interview with everybody from regular community members that maybe nobody's ever heard of to developers, to distro maintainers. And this coming Wednesday, I'm releasing an episode with uh, Mark Shuttleworth. Oh, so, nice. Yep. And it, it's basically a, a conversation between me and them of who they are, where they started, how they started in Linux, and what they're doing today. And it can range from 40 minutes to two hours sometimes. But it's a video uh, that I put out on YouTube, and it's also a, in a podcast form for any uh, podcast app that you have. Two hours? I mean, who would talk for two hours? I've no I don't know who would talk for two hours, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of person would do that? Some guy from who? Ireland, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What do you enjoy most about doing the Linux Spotlight? I enjoy the actual conversation that I have with that person to get to know who they are. When you, like, okay, for example, you have people in the community that I have talked to every week for the last two years, three years sometimes, and I still find out new stuff when I talk to them in Linux Spotlight, because you don't get to talk to them for the full, you know, a full two hours. You're just talking to them with little bits, little, you know, here and there. But Linux Spotlight, it's solely on them that it's, they are in the spotlight and their story is in the spotlight. And some of these people have such a rich history that you would never know unless you actually sat down and talked with them for an hour or two. And I can point to, uh, Jill Bryant, who has such a great history in Linux with her whole family, um, and Barb, Barbara Harris, she was another one. Uh, her uh, journey as far as teaching and using Linux in that way it was fantastic. And this is something that you would never know until you actually sat down and talked with them. I think that's my my favorite part. Um, I I see another question on this list, so I was like thinking that Mike Mike has been reading out every single question, so I might as well <laughs> take the take the mantle and just pick a, a quick a question. Run random. with it. So, what setup do you use for broadcasting? Do you want to plug your your hardware, your microphone, or your um, audio interface, or anything like that? Well, for the setup for hardware, um, I have an Alesis uh, mixer, which is something that one of the guys re recommended because it you know, ran out of the box with Linux for him, and it's been great for me. I have the Shure SM7B mic, which is, in my opinion, the, the best mic on the market. It is way more expensive than any mic on the market as well, but it just... You know, I thought about it, I, and I originally started out with a regular mic, and then I went to a Yeti, and then I, you know, I'm thinking about upgrading, and at, you know, you're spending this money, and it, it sounds like it's cheaper to buy a lower-priced mic, but at the end of the day, when you're spending all this money, by the time you're done, you're going to spend that money anyway. And I just wanted something that was going to give me the best opportunity to give me the best audio possible, other than, you know, maybe... A, you know, a lousy voice or something like that, but uh, at least mask that somehow. <laughs> um, so the SM7B is what I use for a mic. And my, I don't know, other than that, um, I did, I do want to say that I just introduced a cough switch, which is the most fantastic thing ever made known to man for audio recording. <laughs> so it's a foot activated cough switch that, if I need to cough, all I do is step on it, and it cuts my mic out completely. Where that originally, I was using keyboard shortcuts to mute the system volume, and there were times where it muted, and there were other times where I'm muted. It shows the icon that I'm muted, and I'm not muted. So there I am coughing like a maniac, and these people are trying to have a conversation, and it was... So I needed something hardware that I knew was going to work, and it is fantastic. So I just did a quick Amazon search for that microphone that you referenced and 
Yeah, like it's it's getting up there in price, but I suppose that that is what you um you get what you pay for, and it certainly does sound um quite nice from from going coming through the internet airwaves as such, and also on the in the final recording any time that I've listened. Um, I mean, Connor, I've, I sound like Mickey Mouse without this mic. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'll, 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 it remains to be seen. I'll have to meet you in person. <laughs> Um, uh, I, I think I've, we've gone over our hardware in, in the past, but uh, just for comparison's sake, I'm I have an Audio Technica AT twenty twenty the uh, SLR or XLR version, and is going into a Behringer um audio interface that seems and it seems to work fine, and um so much so that the um Shane kept telling me that he was very jealous of my microphone, and Shane has recently brought up, uh, picked up the same microphone, which he said he went into a physical shop and and paid over and above the price because he just wanted. He said, "Oh, give me now." <laughs> oh my! No, he wanted to support. Uh, no, you know, he local, wanted to support local, business local business as well, rather than give it the money to Amazon. Uh, I think because. Uh, it's you know it's, it's it's what he wanted to do. Just to be clear, I did not pick mine up from Amazon. I picked mine up on used on the classifieds. So I, yeah, did, no. I also did not give money to Amazon. I I am the people hater who bought a very cheap mic on Amazon and everybody can hear it in it. It's not just my voice. It's also uh, it's also the fact that my microphone costs about thirty quid. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, and I'm thinking about getting a better, better piece of, of uh, hardware. But then I would also have to learn better. Uh, to, I would also have to learn to speak better. And I'm not sure if I have got the time and will and even mental capability. So I'm just, I might just leave it. Um, in and now I even uh, clicked my teeth into the microphone. I mean, that's professionalism redefine people. <laughs> I'm just leaving a pause here in case uh, Shane wants to cut this out. Done. Uh, so you you obviously Rocco have a, a huge interaction with the Linux community. Uh, how do you find us? Well, the Linux community years ago was not that friendly on a whole. Um, there obviously, you know, you meet different parts. That it depends on timing of when you started and where you started looking. So years ago, it wasn't ex- exactly the best experience. But we have gotten so much better over the years that, you know, it's, it, I would say there are still bad apples every, you know, in certain places, <laughs> but, but we, ha- we have got to the point where I I think you can go pretty much everywhere in the Linux community and have a good experience. There are so many good groups themselves from the Jupyter Broadcasting uh, groups to the Destination Linux Network groups to the Biddle community. Um, to just, Linux lads. Two two Linux lads. Um, <laughs> great plug. Uh, so, Thank but you. what I'm saying is, we have grown so much as a community that, um, and I think it's I think it's awesome, and I think we need to continue that and be treat people like you want to be treated, and that's all. That's that's very wise. What do you what do you like? What do you value the most uh, in the community? I value the individual conversations that I have with people. And it, like I said, you get to know these people, not just on Linux Spotlight, but you know, talking to them through Telegram. Um, just interact, like specifically now, we're in, an, we're in a time where um, everybody's inside, everybody's cooped up, everybody's you know, a little antsy. And to be able to reach out to somebody and say, hey, how you doing? I, I'll give you an example. Uh, Cheese Bacon from Jupiter Broadcasting sends me a message one day and says, Dude, you are so cool. And <laughs> you know, he was joking and it was funny and everything, but it was it was just one of those times where it was it was nice to hear. And I try to do that myself with throughout the week with different people to just reach out and say hello to them, just be normal to them, you know? We're not uh none of us are celebrities. We're just regular people who who like Linux. So if we all treat each other like, you know, if I treat you like you're my best friend, that's what will grow the community and grow us as people as well. Um, so speaking of communities, do you prefer any online spaces over others? For example, uh, YouTube, Reddit, um, Twitter, Mastodon, insert your, your social media um, area here do you find there's more that you tend to gravitate towards or 
Well, you know, obviously being involved in YouTube, I gravitate towards the YouTube community and specifically uh, the Telegram groups. Uh, that is something that I am super active in in, in most of the communities. Uh, Telegram is where I pretty much spend a lot of time. I do spend more time than I need to on Twitter, and I don't know why. Um, but I find, like, uh, for example, um, what do you call it? Gaping me now. The open source alternative to Must MeWe. MeWe. Oh, oh, sorry. MeWe is a place where there are a lot of Linux people, a lot of Linux users, and it's something that I, you only have so much time in the day. Mastodon is another one where I would love to be active on Mastodon, but there's just only so much time in the day. And you, at the end of the day, you go where you can, can be the most active. So I would say that uh, Telegram is where you would find me the most active. Um, in that, I'm just going to give my own um, interactions that I've had. I mean, Mastodon to me is so similar to Twitter, and I feel that I've already got my Twitter headspace down, as in I go to Twitter because I wouldn't want to do X or... Um, or sometimes I'm just casually browsing Twitter and I might just reply to people. So that is already that function has already been fulfilled in my head, has been compartmentalized in my head. Um, Mastodon is way too similar to, uh, from that point of view, just from the use case, um, that I feel that if I was on Mastodon, that I feel that I would just be using a bot to copy and paste what I'm what I'm doing on Twitter because I'm just more active on Twitter unfortunately I mean if if um if Mastodon probably um started or uh, I, was, I came into Twitter late so Mastodon was very much a thing back then but if I if I had interacted with Mastodon before I interacted with Twitter I might be doing the exact same thing on Mastodon that I'm doing on Twitter so you never know um but uh uh, MeWe is actually one that I've not heard of, so I might have to check out. But again, you're you're saying that it's something that you only have so much time in the day, and you can only interact with so many places. Um, so it's mainly uh, Twitter and Telegram for me that I interact with people. Well, for example, um, you know, Biddle has a presence everywhere, uh, whether it's BigDaddyLinux dot com or Telegram or Discord. Uh, discourse forums that we have, um, MeWe, Mastodon, it's everywhere. But, uh, you know, at the end, like I said, at the end of the day, there's only so much time to put into that. So although it's there and there are other people interacting, like with the discourse forums, I personally can't always be there. So Every now and then I get uh, some movement and <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to start, I'll be on Twitter and I'm gonna get engaged with uh, with uh, in people's conversations, and I just can't find the time. I mean, how do you how do you even manage to? Because whenever I open Twitter on my phone, I just see how many messages I'd have to scroll through to get to the top, and I and I and I give up because it's just too much stuff happening. Well, you know, for example, with Twitter, it ain't, you're right. There's no way I'm scrolling through that whole timeline. Half of it's filled with stuff I don't even want to talk about because it's, you know, politics or whatever. Um, but what I end up doing is I end up following, I mean, I've, there's a lot of people that I follow, but there's certain people that I will have notifications for, for every tweet that they put out. And I will try to interact with those notifications. Other than that, you know, there's no way to answer everybody or to talk to make every post. Okay. Uh... Um, one thing I'll just say before you might be speak to and there, Mike, is how I deal with Twitter is I use TweetDeck and uh, TweetDeck, I have three accounts. So I, I have my personal and then the notifications for that. Then uh, I'm also on the our, our Linux community, the Dublin Linux community of that Twitter and of also the Linux lads Twitter and the, the notifications for that. So that is a lot of columns. And because it's personal information, I will I'll put just put it into our our chat that we have amongst ourselves. So if you're if you're curious, but I'm not going to be putting that it is out publicly. But um, that just give you an idea of of uh, of what what I do to um, to manage it. So give me two seconds, and this is probably awkward for the recording, but we'll see. 
<laughs> we are professionals here, dude. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, pictures over radio, people. <laughs> no, I definitely uh, use TweetDeck as well, and I do have columns for certain people that I follow. So that is also a I totally can relate to using TweetDeck and and using that to manage everything. So I just put that up on our Telegram chat. Nice. Uh, yes. So move, making another smooth transition, as I've taken recently to do, uh, You, is there anything, Roko, that you are waiting for to happen in Linux? Something that you are exciting about, that's about to happen, something that you think this is going to be amazing? Well... I am excited for 2004 to release, but I, because I think that's going to be a really awesome release. Everything that I have talked to with people and have tested myself, I think it's going to, I really do think it's going to be a solid release. So I am excited for that. Um, but as far as like something that will, you know, change the landscape or, or anything, um, I'm not looking forward to anything in particular. I'm looking forward to just communicating with people and, you know, continuing the relationship you have with them and just enjoying using Linux. A lot of times we overlook just being able to sit down and, and use Linux and the freedom that that gives us. Uh, we're too busy or we'll be doing work or whatever. And I think if we stop for a moment and just think of how far we've come in Linux from a, just even a few years ago, where you can install a Linux version in 10 minutes and everything just works, including now your NVIDIA drivers that you used to have oh, well, yes. headaches for. Um, we're in such a great time. I think we just need to sit down and realize that and enjoy it. And I would like to um, echo the sentiment in relation to 2004. I've been trying it out in virtual machines and is looking to be an incredibly solid, refined, just polished uh, release. I mean, it's 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 almost like a, a new benchmark for um, how, how polished it seems to be. I mean, obviously, I've not run it on, on any of my hardware at the moment, so I can't comment on whether it has um, some kind of strange bug in relation to some specific hardware that I have. But just from interacting with it in a virtual machine, it seems to be an incredibly refined and polished release, uh, which it's I suppose it's it's. It stands to reason for it being an LTS, but it's something that shouldn't be taken for granted. I mean, there's been LTS versions in the past where there have been something that is quite major and it has to be kind of quickly patched um, even within uh, less than a week, like two or three days of of it being released, of um, people just finding a bug or something that, like that. But... Uh, touch wood but this seems to be an incredibly refined release so um fair play to the guys in canonical for um what seems to be a very solid release with 2004 i've seen yeah i've definitely seen uh, because like i've definitely seen or i can definitely see that linux is uh becoming very stable very usable and i've seen as you did as you said Rico, before that the community is also getting into a heavy place. And I got reminded personally about how things used to be a few days back when, as we are all at home, we are all video conferencing, and I couldn't get into a video conference because of whatever other reasons, it wasn't actually my operating system that was preventing me, but it was... And there was a, a joke that somebody jokingly said, well, just get a Mac, man. And... It it was it was a joke, and I took it somehow somewhat. It made me very cranky. Like I took it seriously. I shouldn't have, obviously. That kind of thing flies around uh, everywhere. You know, be, 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 you know, it was an innocent joke, and I took it way more serious than I should have. And I think I still have it in me, the, because I remember the the time where things only really used to used to work in IE6 or you you just needed to make to have silverlight working to get into stuff or i remember spending uh, a week trying to figure out why my wi-fi isn't working on ubuntu 804 realizing that i in, in my inexperience i'm putting some kind of a password into instead of a hex code and the software is not smart enough to tell me so i think 
this is not even going anywhere as a question, I'd imagine, because I've, I just lost the thread of my thinking here. But <laughs> it is it is interesting how far we've gone in, and it is exciting to realize uh, how far we are from where we've been even 10 years ago, which is not that much that much time compared to the progress that was made on the other platforms which have started that which let's say in the in the 2000 windows was way ahead of uh, where linux was at the time and how much progress happened in the windows world and how much progress happened in the linux world obviously we've had a lot of catching up to do but i think we are pretty much there and now it's just an numbers game um, one thing that we'll say is that um, just when you're speaking, what struck me was when you're saying, oh, everyone was, was targeting IE6. Uh, unfortunately, there seems to be that everyone is targeting Chromium. So, <laughs> so go out and download and run Firefox, people, because it's the only... Um, and it's I'm not just saying that because I'm saying, oh, uh, take one for the team and it's an inferior product. It's a genuinely good browser. <laughs> it's like you will not feel the hardship of of trying out Firefox at all. Um, I use Firefox as my daily driver, and I I very rarely miss it, miss things. But I'm noticing just recently, little things here or there are starting to just target Chromium, and it's kind of annoying. So get that um get the uh the use usage numbers up on Firefox and they would have less of an excuse for um exclusively targeting chromium. Well, I do uh think that Firefox is a great choice, but I also think Brave Browser is an excellent choice as well. It's based on chromium obviously, but I think the ideas that they have, the things that they're implementing are uh really good. So, you know, yes, Firefox is a great choice, but there are others. Isn't uh, Mozilla going to, I have some kind of a vague recall that Mozilla is going to be tr attempting to do something similar to what Brave does with uh, the monetization. I'm not sure, maybe I'm completely wrong, uh, but, and I think they, they should try. I mean, they are, uh, they are, their, their market margin is now so slim that it's down to uh, us people who really want to use Firefox that I think they have got now, they are in a great position to start testing new stuff. Because it's that you know div being being on the razor edge of uh, develop or the cutting edge, sorry, being on the cutting edge of development would be very difficult for Google right now with Chrome. Because if they try something new and it doesn't work out, a lot of people get affected by that. And Mozilla, since they are since they are a bit low on numbers right now, I think if they start, I think now is the time for them. Since Firefox has really improved and it's very stable and fast right now, it's time for them to start looking what they could do with the users they have, what kind of new things they could introduce, uh, whilst not obviously compromising the stability and uh, and the speed of the current Firefox. But I think they could they could look at Brave and think, okay, we can copy this. Um, I've not heard anything particular in relation to the exact revenue model that Brave are doing, but I know that Firefox are exploring um, different revenue models, uh, including um, offering um, ser security services that people would pay for anyway, but you are you get them from Mozilla and you would be um, um, helping Mozilla... Um, Mozilla's revenue stream at the same time like I think they're introducing a VPN and and so on but uh, my understanding of, of Brave and I'm, I'm running Brave at the moment just for this um, video conference call is that Brave's model is that they will um, they have they have an alternative for displaying ads for you so um, they will block the the default the ads by default so they're not intrusive but as an alternative what they will do is they will take the revenue that possibly could have been generated for that and funnel it in a different way and might even be uh, i think they even might even give a kickback to the user who's using the, the browser as well um i've not used brave extensively so people free, feel free to correct me if i'm uh, incorrect in that sense and so I don't know if if Mozilla are copying that exact model, but I do know that they're they're copying or they're not copying. They're um, exploring alternative revenue streams. Yeah, they do have. A, I think they have a balanced um, 
track for their revenue, Brave does. And, you know, it's not uh, popular with everyone. Obviously, anytime you introduce a, a system of revenue, there are going to be people that there are going to be people that don't like it. But I think it's a even handed way of doing it. And um, I hope that uh, Mozilla continues to uh, offer these services, because at some point you would rather them not get their revenue from places like Google and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I hope they continue. So, Rocco, if Linux were to disappear, what would you do? Wow, dude, that is a question in itself. Holy macro, if Linux were to disappear, what would I do? Um, I I don't I can't say of what I would do. Uh, I still have a couple USBs laying around with Linux versions on them, so I might run those for as long as I possibly can. Um, yeah. Other than that, I would probably end up trying to find something. I mean, are when you ask that question, are you talking like all Linux? Like you talking uh, everything, including like BSD and and everything, or what? How how I'm much sure are the, you boxing me in here? I'm sure the BSD guys would be very happy at being told, told that they are Linux. Uh, <laughs> let's say let's say yeah, let's say that you don't have a hobby suddenly because all of this, all of all computing is now Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and that's it. For some reason, uh, Linux has been erased, and BSD and uh, whatever other uh, niche operating system gone. Well, I would have to honestly say that I would probably go with Mac. Um, and the reason being is they have the convergence scene down pat. Um, when you can take a photo on your phone and have it on your iMac instantly, um, and you can continue working on your whatever it may be, your iPad, that, that convergence scene is down pat with with Apple. So that's probably where I would end up uh, although I would still probably run my USBs as long as I could. And would you do you think you'd be able to uh, move your? Uh, do you think you'd be able to change from Big Daddy Linux to Big Daddy Mac, Big Daddy <laughs> Mac, or or do you think you'd have to find a different hobby? <laughs> I would definitely have to find a different hobby. It surely wouldn't. There would. Okay, so here's here's the serious part of that. Um, I would probably go to Mac, but there would be no passion for anything like there would be no excitement about anything it would be just another tool that you would use so i use linux not because uh, of anything other than the community itself is so passionate about everything and i enjoy that so much that's part of the reason why i run linux so yeah i might use a different operating system if linux went away tomorrow but there would be nothing there so i would find other ways to spend my time um, my my thoughts on those two ecosystems are that um, um, Mac. I don't. I, I'm just not used to the to the paradigm. I mean, I know some people are. I'm used to the more the Windows paradigm. So any time that I'm using Mac, it's frustrating in that sense, and also a feeling that it, it, it it's it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason. The Mac world is a walled garden. In other words, it's all tailored for well, if you're inside the ecosystem, it's all good. But don't venture outside. There's these walls. Don't venture outside the walls and uh, insert your eye branding here. And um, they'll have uh, your your eye cable plugs into your eye TV plugs into whatever. Uh, so it's, it's all about the 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 contained ecosystem. So. In my sense, that in that sense, Windows is more open, as in you can still download stuff. And I know they're trying to be with their Windows Store; they're trying to be more Mac-like, but it's still open in a sense. Uh, the defaults uh, frustrate the absolute hell out of me, so I would <laughs> I would have to customize Windows so much. But I would probably settle on Windows if I um because that that's I've been using Windows since Windows three point one, so and that is that is what I'm familiar with. Um Windows ten uh frustrates the hell out of me, but if if that is where I would have to choose between Mac OS and Windows, I'll probably settle on a very heavily customized version of Windows ten. I would probably have to go with a Mac because I've had a Mac and before and it kind of, it worked. And whenever I try to do anything on Windows, it just breaks. And I'm arguably trying things that, like install a specific version of Python and make sure that it run, that, that, that you can run Python scripts on Windows. It's, it's just, it's not easy to do. 
for some reason, you know, changing the environment variables, it's not it's not something, or maybe it's just because I'm not used to clicking through 20 million different menus just to get to something that I can do in the terminal on Linux or on a Mac easily. Maybe if, if uh, Windows subsystem for Linux changed uh, so that instead of uh, instead of being something that is a uh, in the little corner of the window of windows there is that thing that you can use to emulate a real linux uh if it changed and basically the whole operating system could be the, the whole uh, the whole uh, windows experience could be discarded and you could basically use the wsl thing to manipulate the operating system Without ever touching, uh, without ever touching the Windows uh, control panel, which is atrociously poor, for at least for my, for my, op in my opinion, and without ever having to deal with Candy Crush being installed on your computer against your will. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if, if 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 they if you basically could take Windows, okay, leave whatever whatever it is it does underneath. Put Linux on the top of it, and then be able to run uh, i3 or GNOME or anything, just so that you don't have to use the start menu in the bottom, the the the, the Windows 10 menu with that doesn't really search very well when you type things into it. That that if if they if they basically turned it into Linux and discard everything Windows and then make it open source, but then you know that would be Linux and not Windows. That's why it would be better. Um. Yeah. You can't you can't get away with it that easily because you just said, "What if Linux disappeared?" <laughs> oh, I, I would use WSL on on Windows. Okay, yeah. No, <laughs> I, if, if if but then if Linux, okay. So if Linux disappears, then you actually don't have a Mac either because I like we said, okay, uh, BSD. Well, uh, no, yeah, yeah, oh, you're if, introducing BSD of your own accord. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. We've 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 intro we said, okay, there's no Linux and there's no BSD. But if there's no BSD, that means there's no Mac OS either. So you are basically stuck with, and there's no Android. So you are stuck with Windows, and that's it. Or open source. Wow, we are destroying the world here. You know that. <laughs> yes, and also open source doesn't count either. That's basically BSD. <laughs> if there's no <laughs> Linux, there's no Linux servers. Uh, the whole world comes to a stop. So uh, yes. Okay, okay. I think we're, we spent a bit no, enough time on that topic. I think so, I um, think we've spent enough time. Actually, we probably okay. So should wrap it up. <laughs> So on that vein, um, Rocco, anything you would like to plug? Well, um, I would like to plug the awesome members of the Biddle community. Uh, if you go to BigDaddyLinux.com, all of the links will be there to get to the community. But I um, ask everybody to go to the Telegram link, and join the Telegram group, and meet all of the awesome people that are in there. Because um, without any of them... You know, I, I tell them all the time, without any of them joining the live streams, I'd be talking to myself, and that kind of would be boring. So, yeah, definitely check out the Biddle community. And um, I, would, I would very much like to echo that sentiment. I mean, I've I've genuinely, I'm not just saying that because Rocco's here, I've hung out with the commu that community element virtually because I live over here and they live over there for the most part. Even though your 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 community is international, but um, it, it does seem to be a lot of them are over in the States. One day I will make it over and I'll be able to um, join you guys in, in person for a coffee or something like that. But um. It's a genuinely um, wholesome and fun community to hang out in. So, um, speaking of events, uh, unfortunately, Fostock Live is not going ahead. So, uh, I think previously in our previous episode, we said that it was going ahead, but Joe had subsequently announced um, between the time of our recording and the time of our publishing that it w is not going ahead. So, obviously... Uh, we will see if there's any kind of alternative and uh, we had a plan in the back of our mind of what we would do when when we're there. So who knows, we might actually just record that anyway and put that out as an alternative. So you won't be seeing, seeing us doing it live, but you might get it as a recorded podcast. So we'll see what that happens when it comes out. So obviously our thoughts are coming out, going out to everyone who's affected by this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. And it's unfortunate that we can't meet in person and a lot of events are being cancelled, but it's for a very good reason. So stay safe out there, people. Um, 
So our socials, if you want to get in contact with us, uh, we are on Telegram, uh, we are on Twitter, we're on Mastodon. You can email us at show at linuxcloud.com and you can also donate to us. And all of those details are on our web sh- website, which is linuxlads.com. Um, it is, it's, you, it's not a shite website. It's actually a very good website. So um, and we, it's, we uh, did manage to keep it family friendly up until now. Yeah, in the, in the honor of, um, of Rocco, Rocco, we didn't say fuck once. Um, so <laughs> now you fixed that. Uh, <laughs> yes, Rocco, Rocco, any of your uh, which, where could people find you online? Uh, BigDaddyLinux dot com is the website. Uh, I have that name pretty much everywhere: Twitter, YouTube, uh, all of the important places. So uh, search Big Daddy Linux, and you will find it. Perfect. All right. With with this, it's time for us to wrap it up today. We've been talking for quite a while. And uh, I say thank you very much, Rocco, for coming uh, on our show. It's been amazing. Great chatting to you. Indeed. Uh, I had a great time. I love I love the episodes that you guys put out. Listen to them as soon as they air. So it was oh, perfect. Thank you. That's that's great endorsement from you. you. You're in the habit of making great shows yourselves. So uh, that's, that's great hearing this from you. And with this, I've been Mike. I've been Connor. And I've not been Shane. I'm rocking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. <laughs>